Lord God, you are the God even of cold winter winds. Draw near to us and hear our prayers. We give you thanks, O God, that even nature is subject to your divine will, lest we fear even more bitter weather by natural forces and those without limits. Teach us to learn, even from this cold winter, the lessons of your word, to value one another, to share what we have, and to rejoice in all your many blessings. We pray, merciful divine parent, for all those who do not have friends upon whom to depend for support, warm homes into which to retreat on cold nights, and nothing to share. For we know that there are those homeless persons who will attempt to brave this cold alone. Help us help. Help us read out, reach out a hand of compassion to those with nowhere to stay and nothing to eat. Do not let us get so used to the sight of those in need that we allow ourselves to hold back when help is so desperately needed. We pray also, O oh God, for justice for the people of the world who are oppressed by the very governments who are supposed to serve them. We pray that you will let your spirit come upon their struggle for freedom and let them know that they do not struggle alone. We pray too, O oh Lord, for our national leaders, for our Congress, let your word and will be a guide for people on both sides of the aisle. We pray that you will bring our representatives and senators together to find the way forward for the good of the country rather than the good of a party. We have been so blessed by our freedom. Keep us from abusing it. We give you thanks for the dedicated many times nameless persons who do your work without expecting recognition. They are the saints who have labored before us and who make our work possible. And for them, we give you thanks. We pray for this church, O Lord, and for all who come here. Continue to guide our leaders and followers alike to continually seek your will for this place. Give them strength to do all that you would have them do. Give them courage to keep striving toward the vision you have given. We pray for all of those who come here, new to your work. Ease their way into the community of faith and give them your spirit to enliven their lives. We pray, too, for those who are especially in our minds today, for we have confidence that you hear our prayers and having compassion on us will answer in your loving kindness. We pray for the continuing guidance of the doctors for Steve Zarenda, Grace Weekly, Mary Campbell, and Charles Linton. And pray earnestly that you will bring all of them back to full health and vigor, that they may continue to serve you as they have always wanted to do. We make these prayers, O oh Lord, because you have bid us to come to you with our burdens, that we may all pray the prayer your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Listen to the word of God as it is recorded in Isaiah, the 49th chapter. 
beginning at the first verse. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord has called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant? to bring back Jacob to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up. Princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. And hear this word from the New Testament beginning at the 29th verse of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And he watched Jesus walk by. He exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translation means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. 
Ancient Israel was used to speaking to God in prayer and hearing the answer in the intervention of God in their lives and from hearing from the prophets. The miracles of God came, as it were, with explanation. Prophets sometimes even foretold their own successors. In Isaiah, we hear this promise of God through the prophet Isaiah. Another one is coming and he is so great that it would be too trifling a thing for him simply to redeem Israel. Now that's quite a promise to be making to a people who are oppressed and exiled and away from their own home country that a greater prophet is coming than even your redemption. And I can imagine some of the people in that circumstance hearing these words would have said, I could do with a little trifling redemption right now. Trifling would be okay with me. But the promise is, that while the one who is coming will redeem Israel, will bring them back from exile, will put them again on their feet, will be despised, rejected, and rejected by nations until they see him. And then they will bow down. And princes will humble themselves. It was a promise that the survivors of the exile lived on in Israel for years and years and even into generations. The hope that the Messiah would come. Then came John the Baptist. John the Baptist is an interesting character. John lived out the kind of extreme version of the prophet. Now the prophets had always kind of rejected um, the accoutrements of power, the, the trappings of being one who talked to God as being a powerful thing and basically wandered around the country uh, with very little of their own. Um, and if they had a family, struggled to keep them alive. John the Baptist sort of took that to the extreme. John the Baptist might be compared to, I wouldn't say a rock star, um, more like um, for the thoughtful people of Israel, for the faithful people of Israel, would have been perceived as being the one who emblemizes all of those things of being a prophet of the old kind, of the old days. Of, of Samuel who wore the, the old clothes, who ate the, the scrub of the desert, who lived a very simple life and yet in some ways was an outlandish and outrageous character to most of the rest of the community. Uh, you may remember the fellow Tiny Tim from years ago who would try to, to sing his songs and had a very high falsetto voice and, and uh, played a ukulele, and he was mostly a buffoon. He was never really a star. He was famous for being famous. For many people in Israel, that was John the Baptist. For many people... In Palestine, that was John the Baptist, this idiot who wanders the wilderness calling people out for a baptism for the remission of their sins as though he could do that. What makes him think he can do that? And they're standing in the market one day and there are two of, of John the Baptist's disciples standing with him and Jesus walks by and John the Baptist says, he's the one. Behold the Lamb of God. This is the one I've been talking about who comes after me. 
And so the two disciples follow after. And Andrew follows along. And Jesus, this is a, an interesting kind of an exchange between the two of them. Um, and it's lost in, in, the, in the kind of blandness of English. Um, Jesus says, what are you looking for? As in, what do you seek? As you might say to someone who is seeking a better life or is seeking a spiritual life or is seeking something that will fulfill them in their lives. What, what vocation are you looking for? And they answer by, well, where are you staying? As in, what hotel are you in? And there's this, this disconnect that's really rather humorous between Jesus and the disciples over this discussion. And Jesus never misses a beat and says, come and see. And so they stay with him the whole day. One would presume listening to what he's saying or simply sitting and abiding with him. We don't know. And at the end of the day, Andrew goes and gets Peter, or not Peter, excuse me. Yes, he goes and gets Peter and comes back and brings him back to introduce him to Jesus. You know, I want you to meet my new best friend. And Jesus looks at Peter, knows who he is, and gives him a new name. Cephas. Now, what I want to focus on today is the business of John the Baptist and these disciples. Because in John, and this is one of the unique things about the Gospel of John, and there are lots of reasons that I'm not going to go into that John tells the story this way. In John, rather than Jesus going out and calling these two disciples to his work, they come to him. And they're a very unlikely pair. They are working class folks. They're the ones who bring the food to market. These are the ones who, who work and labor all day. These are not the kids who went to the rabbinical school to learn scripture and to understand the teachings of God. These were the kids who got just enough education in the school in order to be able to go to temple. They learned just enough in order to be able to say the prayers. They took just enough stuff um, to make it through confirmation class. And yet, they followed Jesus, and as they say, the rest is history. What's interesting for us about this passage in this examination is that we're looking at how John is a signpost. John is not the prophet who delivers the word of God that will change the world, but he is the one who points at the one who will change the world. And in their own way, the disciples, Andrew becomes a signpost who goes and tells Peter, I have found the Messiah. And I think that there's a helpful piece to that. As someone said a long time ago, there are two kinds of advice. There's the advice that is the information. And there's the advice of, if I were you. And the problem is, when you advise someone and say, if I were you, you're not them. What's important about a signpost is that it be timely, clear, and accurate. And for those of us who drive up and down the interstate, that can be a problem. Because I've noticed that as we get older, the time that it takes to take in that information that we see on the signposts and the time that it actually registers in our brain and tells us that we should do something, we have a, it takes a little longer to get from out there to in here. 
And so the signposts, I think, we feel need to be a little bigger. They need to be put a little further in advance. And they need to be a, sometimes a little more accurate. Two centuries ago, Thomas Jefferson attempted to cut and paste the moral teachings of Jesus into now what is known as the Jefferson Bible. Some of you may have seen it. It became a curiosity, but never a bestseller. My hunch is that without connecting those moral sayings, the parables, the stories, that Jefferson thought were good moral teaching that spoke to the intellect. That without the gospel that connects those things together, it's really very bland and useless. Because Jefferson, for all of his good intent, had fallen into fussing at people as if to say, if I were you, I would follow this parable that I have clipped out of the gospel. While scripture says, let those who have ears hear. Meaning not that we're being fussed at by scripture, but that we're receiving a promise of hope and grace. And that we're receiving accurate, timely, and clear information. The signpost of the gospel is a direction to help us get back to relationship with God if we're not there, or to strengthen the relationship that we already have. At the same time, we are signposts. And we are the best kind of signpost when we simply live our lives in faithfulness to the gospel, in transparency to our friends, and in outreach to those that we do not know. We are kind of like those literal signposts out on the highway. The one that says, three miles from here is the interstate. And if you think about it for a minute, we, we indulge in a little bit of anthropomorphism, the signpost never knows who gets helped by that information. They never know whether the person gets to their destination. They never know whether it was worthwhile to be there as a signpost. People simply pass by and either absorb the information or ignore it. And truthfully, sometimes that's the way of our world. We can only point in the direction of God by living our lives as one who is in relationship with God. Because if we fall into fussing at others and giving and advising others, we fall into that pattern of, if I were you. All we can do is to say, this is what I do and it helps me. And to offer words of hope and healing to others, rather than fussing. If you'll permit me a small indulgence. I taught religion at Pembroke State University for several years. And while I was there, I must have had a thousand, maybe more students in the Introduction to Religions course. Well, years later, after I had moved up here with my family, I am in the Crabtree Valley Shopping Center in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm looking around at the stores and enjoying my time. I was down there on a business trip and really took a little time off to do a little shopping and wasn't finding anything and wandering around, not much paying any attention to what I was doing. And this family runs up to me and the mother is saying, Reverend Robinson? And I'm going, ooh, wait a minute, what did I do? I didn't do it. And she says, I, w I, want to, I, I want to say hello and I want to thank you. 
uh, my name is such and such, and this is my husband, and these are my two beautiful children, and indeed they were beautiful, and I hugged her, and we stood there and talked for just a few minutes, and finally I had to look at her and I said, I am sorry, but I have no idea who you are. And she said, I was a student in your introduction to religion class, and it changed my life. I about fell over. Now, if that, can happen, if that can happen to someone as simple as me, who was just teaching an intro to a religion course, who really wasn't doing any sort of preaching or proselytizing or, or trying to convert people, but simply challenging people to use the brains that God had given them to, to think about their faith and to learn about what they did believe. Where are we missing the boat? Do we not see how the simplest acts of grace and encouragement and hope change people's lives. How just being a signpost, it's not me, it's over there, can change a person's life. Because most of us, frankly, are just looking. You know, we rarely comment on good signage. But we always know when we've run into bad signage or no signage. When we go to the hospital and we can't find the admitting room because there's no sign that says admissions. Or if it's hidden behind some other sign that says please come to our gift shop. We know how frustrating and confusing and discouraging that can be. Because especially when we're going, <coughs> going to a doctor's office or to a hospital, we're already cranked up to be anxious. We're already cranked up to be concerned about, are we getting this right? Are we going to the right place? And when the signage is bad, it makes it worse. And we become discouraged and hurt, and upset with ourselves, and more than that, upset with wherever we are, that they couldn't do, you know, surely did they not send somebody out here to walk up and down these halls to realize how confusing this is. I've been to one hospital that had really good signage. It was in Durham, North Carolina. And they had painted uh, or tiled lines on the floor. It had a red line that had emergency written on it. And you just followed that red line to get to the emergency room. And it had another one that was a green line that said testing. And you followed that green line. Of course, it had all the other signs. But I asked someone, how did you figure out to do that? And she said, well, we watched how people walked. And they were not walking through the halls looking up at the ceiling where we had had the signs before. And we were still getting people asking us, where is such and such? And we would point at the sign and say, see, it says off here to the, to the left. We realized that people were looking at the floor when they're going through the hospital. And that gave us the idea, if people are looking at the floor, maybe that's where the sign should be. Well, now that gives us a challenge, doesn't it? Is that we need to be the signposts for others and to be really outlandish here, not just to find Jaredstown Presbyterian Church, because there's fairly good signage to get to Jaredstown. At least it's gotten better since the first time I came here. However, we need to help people find their way to God, because Jaredstown is just another signpost. We need to be encouraging and gracious and helpful to others. We need to live our lives in such a way that people will ask us, how could you do that? Because when we do, people actually do find their way to God. People really are encouraged to strengthen their connection with God. People really are spiritually enriched. And they'll get the rest of it. They'll get the moral stories. They'll get the parables. They'll get the stuff that Jefferson wanted them to read. And in the words of of, uh, of John Prine, 
They'll find Jesus on their own. But they've got to have signposts to get there. So that when we are caring, when we are gracious, when we show the love and care of God to others in our lives, even those that we don't particularly like, we are a signpost. We are John the Baptist. We are Andrew. We are the ones who are saying, in the way we live, without ever having to say, I know Jesus. Do you? Without ever having to say those words, but living our words with care and love, we are able to help others get connected and come and listen and come and see. And that's the good news that I came to bring you today. And now I charge you to remember in all you do and say, you are a signpost to God for those who see you, who interact with you. And the direction that we are all going in is toward God. Be clear, reliable, and truthful signposts for others in the way we live our lives with hope and grace. And now go out in the world of peace and be of courage, of good courage. Help the suffering, support the weak, return no person evil for evil, honor all men and women, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.